I, I'm very conscious that um, there's at least four people in the audience who've seen me speak before, and I've actually only got four jokes, um, and I use them every presentation I've got. So I was going to sort of, I've got some, some slides, but you know what, they're a bit for comfort, that actually it's quite nice if I run out of things to say to have them there. Um, um, but I've been doing low work for about eight years, probably, on the older consumer, who they are, and what they spend their money on. Um, and, um, and, and, and I've just, an, an apology, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to run before the end, but um, it's partly because I've moved down to Bognor Regis. And one of the interesting things about moving down to Bognor Regis, for those of you who don't know it, is it's an ageing town. Um, um, you have Butlins tourists who are very, very young, but essentially the population living there is, is relatively old, as many coastal areas in the UK are. And, and I think one of the really, and I spend a lot of time watching the older consumer in Bognor. And what's really interesting is actually they buy the same stuff that we do. They do exactly the same we do. So I'm just going to run on, and this is going to be my completely disorganised way of doing this, um, to, um, to actually, you know, I'll run sort of... Um, to sort of what people say about, you know, what older people spend. You know, you have people like Mintel talking about, well, older people spend more on drugs and more on coffee, more on social care and less on champagne. The German beer industries blames the ageing population for its decline. Um, but actually, and this was some work that did from beers, so I don't know how solid they would claim it to be, but um, what this does is look at growth um, in different business sectors over the next sort of 20 years or so. Um, and and um, actually what's really interesting is that um, demographic change represents a significant proportion of growth we'll see in things like the food and drink industry and the alcohol industry, a lot less so in other areas. But I think one of the really interesting things that came out of this work that Biz did is yes, demographic change um, is, going to be is going to represent a significant proportion of growth for certain sectors. But actually, we, we are, you know, all of this talk that we, we buy different things as we age, actually it doesn't really hold up. If you look at you spe expenditure on communications, for example, it's about 3% across the life course. So actually, people who are 18 spend about 3% of their income on, on communications. People who are 75 do. They don't spend it on the same things, more likely to spend it on fixed line telecommunications as you get older. But actually, broad categories, if you exclude health costs, if you exclude education, we don't, you know, we buy the same stuff. We go to the cafes, we go to Marks and Spencers and buy our £10 meals on a Friday night. We actually do the same sort of things. We all buy washing powder. Um, so, so, so that was sort of where I wanted to start. Actually, we're not, we're not that different. The world doesn't change too much as we get older. Um, uh, and Bogner is my real test bed. I've done lots, as I say, you know, I did produce this report a year or so ago for, for Age UK. Um, and one of the things that came out of it w w was some work, some mystery shopping we did as part of it. And we got all the people to do mystery shopping into whatever they wanted. And I just want to pick sort of three examples, really, to kick off. Um, one was um, a lady who, who talked about wanting to buy a photo frame for her photo of her daughter that um, she'd had on a fridge. Um, she was housebound, she couldn't get out to buy this. She didn't want to ask the carer um, because the carer already did all these amazing things for her um, and she felt it wasn't the carer's job, which actually may or may not have been the case. Um, so actually you had this lady who, who had money, wanted something, couldn't get it and actually it was quite important for her because this photo of her daughter was, at, you know, was tied onto the fridge. We had a guy who was housebound who lived actually in, um, and there's lots of these down in Bognor, um, who lived in um, some, um, what do you call it, park homes. Uh, he lived in a park home. He was housebound. He couldn't get to the post box. He, for years, had ordered mail order trousers, um, but actually got to a stage where he couldn't return them. If they didn't fit, there was no way of him getting them back to the post office to return them. Um, so he was in this situation where actually he didn't, you know, he couldn't engage in the, in, the consumer, in the consumer marketplace in the way he wanted. Also, I have to say, the other thing he said is there's no choice for men in mail order trousers, which I didn't realise. Uh, <laughs> you have these huge catalogues of, you know, clothes which are 90% for, for, for women and you have one pair of black trousers for men, apparently. It's, 
Um, the world may have changed post-internet. Um, although actually, there's a really, you know, interesting thing that um, that I'm really interested that uh, about actually the the potential of the internet in the in this sphere. We've got about four million people over 75. We've got a million people who are housebound in the UK. Yet we've got almost no one over 75 buying their grocery shopping online. You know, actually, what what's going wrong here? Why is the market not delivering for this group of the population? Um, the third example I just want to throw at you is a, a lady who was blind who wanted to go and buy nice clothes but didn't have anyone to go with her to show her what was nice. So you know, w w what we found really was that actually there, were, there was a desire to engage in the consumer marketplace. But it, for many people it didn't work, particularly some of the most excluded and vulnerable. Um, and the most common question whenever I've talked about this, it, this bit of work, and is sort of, well, how do I, you know, I get sort of, particularly when you do it to a corporate audience, is how do I, you know, how do I sell to them? What do I, you know, what do I do? And actually, I'm, I, I have no idea at all. And actually, I find this sort of actually quite exasperating that, because we may be asking the entirely wrong question, um, I, you know, I find, you know, I find it truly depressing that I've been talking about the same issue for seven or eight years. And, and one of the things, what I really want to do actually is a bit of dampening enthusiasm here actually about the potential. Um, and let me run on to another slide which, to exemplify my, um, some of the challenges, I think. Um, this um, is, is a slide from the Wealth and Assets Survey. We're about to have the new Wealth and Assets Survey figures. What this very clearly shows is up until, this is um, financial wealth by age, up until 55 to 64, our wealth goes up and it, slows, it starts to slow down, it starts to go down. Um, this is the median wealth, the slightly poorly designed because it's hard to see, colour is median. Um, so, so what you have, um, people like me often when the audience suits, saying things like, well, older people spend £97 billion, over 65 spend £97 billion in the UK, the over 50 spend almost £300 billion as consumers. Um, um, but actually, le firstly, let's not be surprised that the peak of our income is between 50 five to 64, this is going to be the peak of our earning potential, this is going to be where we've earned most of our money. Um, and let's also not be surprised that that declines past that post and let's nip that point and let's also, and this is I think the very real danger, not assume that this is going to continue to move to the right. Let's not assume that we're going to about to see this huge market around this um, as we get further to the right. And, and, and the difference between the mean and the median is really important here because actually what this highlights is what you've got is a group of the population who are very wealthy, potentially 20% who are very, very wealthy, and we've got about 50% on means-tested benefits. So the difference between mean and median is huge. So we've just got to be really careful about, and I think this is at the heart of why lots of companies over the last 20 years have come into this market for, you know what, it's too bloody hard. I can't do it. No one's buying the stuff, can't work out the marketing, can't find a way of getting hold of them. David, I, yep. I forgot my statistics. Can you just remind me again between the mean and the median? Median is the difference in between the top and the bottom, and the mean is average. Um, I'm not a statistician either, so I run the risk of getting myself out of my comfort zone, but essentially the difference between them is suggests... It, it, this, this issue that what you've got is a, a group of a very small group of the population with lots and lots of money, and the the majority actually were very low incomes. But that said, when we did this work, we, what we really wanted to say was actually everyone, buy, people at the bottom buy washing up powder. They buy some of these, you know, things. And actually, um, social services often buy, their children buy services for them. So, so I just went into dampen enthusiasm uh, a, a, a little. Um, the, you know, and what we know as well, though, is that, even at the top end, uh, and, and we did some quite interesting work, again, looking at the Wealth and Assets Survey and the English Longitudinal Study on Ageing, was that there's a group of the older population who've got loads of money who aren't spending it. Um, so, so actually, there's a real interesting issue. If you go back to the examples I gave earlier, of actually, you've got obviously got market demand. Um, you've got a, a market which... Um, is delivering very well for certain groups, certain groups of the older population. But actually, we've got 
untapped wealth, untapped resource. And, and what, what you then see is, well, companies sort of saying, well, God, there's this potential here, let's go and get it. And, and I think this is where then the ch challenge comes in because what they do is they get their marketing team and their PR agency to spend six months on older consumers saying, oh, this is too bloody hard, I'm not going to bother with these group, and, you know. You know we, uh, and, and, you know, part of the problem, part of the, the, the reason and the rationale for this is that there's a... Um, is it's very easy to jump into the, well, older people don't switch. You know, they don't swatch brands, so why should we bother spending? We've put all this money in, they haven't switched. We've spent 20 quid on this ad campaign and it hasn't worked. Um, um, but actually, that may be part of the problem. We do know that in financial services, in insurance, in telecoms, where we've got the evidence is older people are less likely to switch providers than, than, than other age groups. However, what we also know is we've got a small number of providers in that sector who benefit significantly from having older consumers who've never switched. Um, so actually, it's not in their interest, particularly some of these big companies, to actually engage and motivate this, this market. Um, and I think there's a very, very big challenge there. When I was at Help the Aged, I used to be head of policy at Help the Aged, one of the big, um, you know, I, I used to get, um, I don't want to over-exaggerate, but certainly, I was there five years, certainly every six or eight weeks, I'd have someone phone me up and say, I've got this really bloody fantastic product, it's amazing, you know, how can we sell it to older people? Oh, you know, actually, firstly, you should have asked them whether they wanted this product in the first place. But, but actually, the, 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 you know, the, one of the real challenges in this sector is that there's loads of ideas, there's loads of products, and some of them are amazing. I go on so much about the basics, you know, the bath rail sort of thing, but there is a product you can buy in B&Q that is a, a bath plug that, ch that changes colour when the water is too hot and lets water out when the water pressure is too high. There are about 40,000 people in the UK who have, sc uh, have scalded each year as a result of bath injuries, and I don't know how many people leave their baths on and it floods and causes all sorts of damage. But actually, that's a product that costs £6. It's hidden on the 26th shelf of B&Q somewhere. Um, you can't find it. They, the staff wouldn't even know it was there, but it's there. But we're not selling it. We're not getting it to the consumer. Why, why is it? And a bit of it is this desire, denial of ageing. And I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of time, so I'm not going to say very much more. Um, but I think a bit of it is, that, is this, is the Germain Greer, because I'm over 60, no one se wants to sell me anything anymore. But it's the other way as well. It's that actually older people, none of us want to admit we're ageing. So actually it's really difficult to convince us if we ever use a message around, you know, you should buy this, you're old, no one's going to buy it. And let's not be surprised about that. Um, um, this is a Google image from... Um, um, which is one of the first things. And if you go do a Google search for um, shopping, um, pretty much 90% of the, and I'm guess making this up, um, don't tell my research colleagues, um, but basically the vast majority of the first few Google image pages are young women carrying shopping bags when you put shopping into Google. Now, actually, what, what is it we're saying about um, about consumption and about the private sector, if actually we know that um, the over 50s spend, what, 44p in every pound in the consumer market space, but every image is this. Every image is the, the young woman going into um, high street shops and coming out smiling, of course, with, with some nice bags. Um, I, um, what, I know you're, you're very, I, I could go on for ages, I'm, so I'm not going to. Um, can we get these slides online? Yeah, yeah, I've got them on slide share, so we can sort of share those. Um, and, and maybe I'll just run through, 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 through my six things for you to think about. Um, first one, older consumers as giver and recipient. Actually, older people don't just buy stuff for themselves, they often buy for their children. Um, but equally, children often buy stuff for their grandparents. How, you know, where does that fit into the world of marketing to older people? Um, so apparently, older people spend about 25% of, uh, buy about 25% of toys and 25% of confectionery. I have to say, I think this is made up, but um, I've never found any reference or source to this, but everyone uses it, so why not? You know? um, but actually, there's a really interesting issue here that actually it's clear older people buy a lot for their grandchildren, the grandchildren buy a lot for older people. How does that fit into the marketing mix? 
£50,000 grandparents spend on their first grandchild. Again, PR, who knows if it's really real, but, you know, actually, you know. But fifty fa but fifty thousand pound divided by eighteen years, it, you know, beyond, you know, it's not, you know, no, not, no, no, no. So, so it's not, it's not in their first year. Um, and, and, and actually, I haven't got it here, but and, um, I, I, am I allowed to mention companies' names? Maybe. Um, yeah. I, um, no, I probably shouldn't. But a big telephone, um, a big mobile operator said to me that one of the big issues that they've got is that the over 70, that, that you know, if you go to Oxford Street on a Saturday, if you go into a mobile phone store and say, I want a mobile phone for my 75-year-old, and you're a 75-year-old yourself, they will sell you the right phone because they don't make money on the handset, they make money on the calls. They have no interest in a product that actually you throw in the drawer. The problem is it isn't the 75-year-old, 80-year-old who ever goes into the shop. It's the son or daughter who doesn't realise that hearing is going, that the ability to use the fingers is going. So actually, the problem is that it's often not the right person buying the product. Um, I won't say much about representation of older people, but I think it's a big issue, except I don't think there's a lot of evidence that older people are poorly represented. I think there's a lot of evidence that older people, particularly older women, are underrepresented. And I think that's important if you go back to the image of the lady with the shopping bag, that actually, given that older women play a huge part in the, uh, uh, have huge economic spending, and yet they're completely invisible from the marketing world. Um, he says, making a vast generalization. Um, um, technology, massive opportunity, but um, you know we've still got this huge, huge gap in terms of digital divide. How you know how do we breach? How, how do we breach that? Um, inclusive design, I know you're very interested in, was a, a really big theme coming from older people. This was Google who overnight, um, about three years ago now, doubled the size of their entry box without telling anyone why they did it. And essentially, there was a blog from one of their designers who basically said, we realised we've got an ageing society. And whilst we were actually, they didn't say this, but clearly Google were one of the most accessible search engines anyway, but doubling the size made them even more accessible. So, you know, think companies are starting to think about this. You know, this is my local Indian restaurant menu. You know, actually, it's crazy. You know, we're making so many basic mistakes. Um, I've talked about shopping around. Um, age discrimination is still, is still an issue despite the, the legislation we've, we've got. Uh, um, you know, see, but, and, and this, perhaps just to conclude, is, um, is I think why I'm most depressed. This was September 2010. I'd been working on this issue for about five years. You have someone who's made this decision. Why the hell? You know, a company as big as Interflora doesn't think someone in their seven, for their 70th birthday or 80th birthday would want a blue. It's just crazy and actually highlights the huge challenges we've got to reach this market. Um, I'm going to stop there. No, I'm going to say my last bit, which I appreciate a few of you have heard. You know, this is my. I'm not really convinced that the world is changing as much as, uh, as we think it is. The sort of saga story of. We're, we're all changing, um, we've got this, we have got this wealthy group of people and we've got this sort of, you know, older people have got fewer ties to responsibility, homes paid for, free from obligation, potential market, you hear this a lot, increasingly, except this was 1962, 50 years we've been talking about the healthier, fitter, older consumer who's going to start buying this stuff and yet it's never happened. Now, now actually, that suggests to me huge market failure here. Um, um, and, and, and actually, and, and I apologise again for the three people who've seen these before, these are my favourite ageing slides which highlight, I think, the diversity of the challenge we've got is that I think part of the problem is this. It's that, um, you know, I don't know any older people who, or, you know, these probably aren't that old, people who go running in their jeans. I don't, you know, I don't know any women at all, and yeah, I have yet to be challenged on this, in, when I've presented on this lots of time, who put their wicker basket on wet sand. Um, <laughs> you know, actually, what we've got is this imagery that mainly comes from the financial services about how wonderful old age is, and now we'll all be sitting on a beach, and you know what, we don't all want to do that. Um, so I'm going to stop there, but thank you very much. Thank you.